Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the tonight's meeting. Before we get started, I want to establish a quorum. So, board members, when I call your name, please uh, answer that you're here or not. I guess. Bates Here. Jenny D. Campbell. Here. Shannon Beasley. Here. Paula Davidson. Here. Gary Grove. Here. Bruce Savy. Here. And I'm Martin on the here. Call this meeting at 6.30 to p.m. Okay, right now we're going to have a stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and followed by a moment of silence. <laughs> and allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll get down to the first order of business. Uh, first order is an announcement, communication, and presentations. Construction update with Mr. Paul Hull's house. Mr. Hull's house. Howdy, good evening. Just a quick run through of uh, where we are on multiple projects, obviously the largest one being Yogara. But uh, before we go there, let me just show you a few shots of, uh, of the fine arts edition. Uh, there's kind of the finished product as you look at that. Uh, that in the foreground, of course, is the scene shop. And the background back there is uh, the dance studio. Uh, so as you, uh, that roll up door, you see that there, right? Kind of the center of the picture. Uh, if you walk in that door, the next picture shows someone standing in the scene shop uh, looking back toward that door and as you pan to the left or the next one you'll see there's another rolled up door that goes into the costume shop area uh, that enters then into another rolled up door that actually goes into the stage area of the performing arts center so that's how that's all connected uh, this is a picture here of actually standing in the existing building uh, looking back toward the newest portion of the building. So you can see kind of it was just a seamless now uh, extension to what the existing building was. Uh, scene shop being on the left and the dance studio being on the right. And the, actually the first door you come to would actually be this locker room that you see here in the next picture. Uh, and the only thing, the only finishing touch to that would be to add the benches that were uh, given to us. We have the benches that, we, that our maintenance crew is actually going to install. And they're they're getting ready to do that as soon as we sign all the substantial completion papers uh, next page just kind of shows an idea of uh, standing in the dance studio looking from left to right a nice large storage area with a large roll up door on the left and then a smaller room on the right to get into the same area just to the right of that second door uh, is, a, is a nice uh, office area that can house up to a couple of people three if you had to uh, and then for the, the small door to the right of that is that area, as I said, goes into the locker room area. And then there's another door that goes from the locker room into that corridor that we just see, saw in the last couple of frames. Uh, and then so shifting around, standing on one side of the dance studio, you can see what this looks like. Now, I, I have to tell you, sit here today, that it is not 100% complete finished because they are still installing mirrors as we speak. Uh, so all of the mirrors have not yet been installed, but it is in process right now. They started last week and they're, they're still working on the final touches of that. So once the mirrors are installed uh, and uh, we actually have a floor hatch that gets under the building that came in that was the old size where they had to be reordered. And once the mirrors are installed, installed and the floor hatch is done, it will be 100% complete, ready to occupy. So nice, beautiful addition to the Performing Arts Center. Uh, moving forward in Aladaria, I'll mention just a little before and after picture. This is what it looked like 30 days ago, looking at the front of the building. And then the next picture now just shows what kind of progress you have there. Uh, you can see the canopies have been installed. A lot of the asphalt striping on the asphalt has been installed. This is the front of the building, standing kind of on top of uh, where Aladaria Hills uh, Road is, looking down toward the 
uh, obviously in the front of the building. Uh, so a lot of progress been made there in the last 30 days. Uh, again, next picture just shows uh, some more of the same, just a closer look at what the front of your building will look like. Uh, the space between the uh, area you see in the foreground with the parking lot area and the building itself, you'll see two lanes there uh, for parent pickup and drop off. One, one way traffic. Uh, again, a before and after picture. This is standing on off on the side near Grossenbacher Road, uh, looking back toward the front of the building. And the next picture shows you the progress that's been made there. So, a lot of things have happened here in the last 30 days. Next picture shows uh, as you walk into the front of the building, this is what it looked like 30 days ago, and the progress they've made in the, uh, in the hardwood and the ceiling uh, and the sound panels on the next page. You can see how quite different it looks, and obviously it has not been completed, uh, but it is in, in progress. That, that's that tongue, tongue and groove hard, hardwood that's going in the ceiling. Uh, it's been varnished. And then, of course, you have, if you can't see it, but really to the center, the bottom part of that is that tree that, uh, that goes into that entryway. And you see a lot of the sound panels have been, been added as well. So a lot of progress there is just as, as, as you walk into the building, uh, you will be impressed, I can guarantee. Uh, just gives you an idea, just the 30 days ago, they were prepping for uh, vinyl tile flooring. Uh, and putting the first coat of paint on the on the accent walls, doing those kind of things. So the next picture shows a little progress of seeing your your VCT being ins installed, uh, seeing your whiteboards being installed, as well as your white and tack boards on the on the opposite wall. In the next picture, uh, gives you the progress of the final touches starting to come in uh, into the building. Still, certainly a long way to go, but uh, you know once you see all the flooring and the things on the wall and those type of things. Next picture will show uh, a lot of your cubbies have been installed in all of your classrooms. So a lot of that casework, the mill work is, is, is started. There's a lot of that progress going on. Next picture kind of gives you an idea what the hallways look like. Uh, again, the vinyl top flooring has been installed and you can see the, uh, the final coat of painting is, is starting to be uh, done throughout the building. You can see there's some accent painting that that coordinates with that particular room and the accent walls and the flooring in that room on the outside of the corridors to break up the long hallways. Uh, next picture uh, gives you an idea of what the, this is uh, standing where the circulation desk in the library would be looking back toward the reading area, uh, that little alcove that you see right there. Uh, and then see how the color has been introduced into the building using colors on the piping that goes in the ceiling there. Uh, it's really a nice touch. I, I actually like it a whole lot better than I thought I was going to like it. Uh, but it, it really gives it an elementary vibe when you walk in there. So this is a neat elementary library. Of course, we're in the process of uh, ordering our shelving and getting ordering our, our desks and tables and everything that go in there that's not necessarily in this contract. Next picture, just right, out, right outside that library, like we have at all our elementary schools, uh, we have this, these display cases. You can see the lighting has been installed in the display case, and that's getting ready for the final touch for that as well. Next picture, just give you an idea of, of uh, this is the ramp that goes from the cafeteria into the stage area on the side, and you see the handrails have been installed in that area as well. And next page, just give you an idea, as I said, a lot of the casework, in this case, the mill work in, in throughout the building is, is being put in. This happens to be the teacher workroom, uh, one of the teacher workrooms inside the uh, building near the uh, fourth and fifth grade wing. Uh, partitions in the restrooms that are being installed can give you an idea of the progress they're making in those areas. And this, again, this is kind of a little before and after picture. If you walk outside the cafeteria, uh, out toward the uh, uh, area where the play area is going to be and the ball fields, all that stuff. There's a porch out there, and obviously here's the porch. And, and this was the progress they made on that. Uh, it, it actually looks like wood, but it's actually a metal soffit that's going underneath there. And the next picture shows what that looks like. It close to a finished product. It's just, it's just beautiful. It's just, you, you will also you will be impressed when you walk out there and see all of that. And obviously the, the nice large oak trees out there that were saved. Uh, in order to incorporate that into that area as well. 
Next picture just gives you an idea again the canopies, uh, as I said, the canopies in the front of the building were installed. They were also installed. This is the, the, the side of the building, the Rosenbacher side where the bus loop comes in. So they have also been installed right outside the cafeteria. Those are the cafeteria doors that you see right there. Uh, this is uh, the cafeteria floor tile that's being laid, uh, getting ready for once all that's in place. Uh, I believe next week. Uh, they'll be start. They'll start receiving the uh, kitchen equipment and start uh, looking at installing all of that. So that's that's all on target as well. That will look significantly different in the next 30 days. Uh, you can see that the uh, gym equipment is being installed. The wall panels or the or the wall padding, uh, rather, being installed throughout or, or all the way around the gym. So, and you can see the sound panels as well in the gym area. Again, bringing those those primary colors into an elementary school, really making it look like an elementary school. Here you can see there's a lot of sod being placed throughout the uh, areas outside the building. This is the area as you're standing close to the building, looking back out toward Ladera Hills uh, in the parking lot. And speaking of Ladera Hills, this was kind of an idea of what it looked like 30 days ago and the progress that, that, uh, that the developer is actually uh, doing in order to uh, accommodate the uh, entrance to our building and fast forward here's what it looks like uh actually that's what it looked like just a little over a week ago uh, now if you drive over there you can see all the curbing is done at this point in time they're just ready for asphalt so timing is just right for them uh in april to have that all finished so elementary number five you know i i can't tell you for sure substantial completion is going to be april 30th that's still the target it certainly might be but if it's not it's going to be very close to that We'll certainly be ready for 2001 2002 school year as we spoke in the last couple of meetings remember we moved the going to the high school now uh and, and adding the performing arts center and doing the work we did around the athletic facilities and doing all that stuff we remember we were getting the high school ready uh, for completion of the high school before you have to start discussions on the next high school uh, and part of that was moving the counseling center from the back of the building, if you will, up to the front of the building near the administration office and actually across the hallway from the nurses station. Uh, this is what it looked like as a finished product. And once those uh, counselors and all the other inhabitants come in, the next frame will show you how they just kind of made it look like home. So uh, they are in there right now. And they're functioning out of there. It's, again, it's a nice facility. They have everything they had in the other one. There's, here's a little area for our students to uh, get on computers in, in, in that area. Uh, next one is just shows you a typical counseling office. Uh, they do have two storage facilities in that area as well. This just happens to be uh, one of the records where, where they keep their records. Uh, so they, they have that just like they had where they came from. Uh, and they also have a break room, which is what you see here. So all the amenities of home, so to speak. Reversing that now, having vacated the, the counseling center, uh, that allows them to put the health careers back into that area where you'll, uh, you'll have a, uh, a classroom, you'll have individual rooms here that you see, kind of where the counselor's office were, and the very far back that you see there, kind of a smaller classroom or a clinical area where you, you get smaller groups of students to teach. So uh, they have great ideas for all that, and we're doing everything we can to accommodate uh, what that program needs in order to make that a nice addition to the, to the health careers to, to our high school program. So that's, that's going to be really cool. This is just an example of what that clinic area is, is going to look like. We had to take a wall out there. And when you do that, you have to uh, adjust a lot of things in the, above the ceiling. So that's all in progress. And last but certainly not least, uh, we expanded uh, seating in the cafeteria to accommodate additional growth. Uh, that wall that was in back of the stage has been opened up, uh, goes into what has now been, uh, or has previously been, the stand, the, the dance studio. So now they vacate that, go to the new dance studio. That gives that area uh, room in order to put additional tables or use the, allow the cafeteria to use it as, as they wish, uh, but certainly can accommodate additional dining if they need to. Uh, we did add a, you can see a kind of a black curtain off to the right hand side where we can still seal that off with the curtain and still use that stage as a stage in the event you wanted to, or use that other room for something else temporarily by sitting that off with that curtain. Uh, but 
ultimately the goal there was to be able to feed more kids uh, at, in, at the same amount of time by, by adding additional seating, and that certainly allows us to do that. Things are going well. But I thought community thing we're doing in the house. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They're putting the title in today. They started putting the title in, so it's a little further ahead. So now, yeah, those are old pictures. We met with them uh, a few weeks ago. And one classroom will be large and one will be a little smaller. But that's the second program that has a little bit of space in it. And that other stuff is on patient rooms and they have to do it. They have to do it. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Very appreciate good. all the help. Hey, moving on to another letter B, it's the financial briefing. This is a one. Good evening. Uh, these are the reports for the uh, month ending February. Um, uh, current period revenue is recognized was uh, 2.4 million. Year to date revenues is 33.4 million, leaving us to get uh, estimated revenue at this time of 20.7. Uh, our current appropriations or current period uh, expenditures can you scroll for me, sir? is 4,014,362. Year to date expenditures 25,556,000. Dollars and nine hundred twenty cents. Nine hundred twenty-five million five hundred fifty-six thousand nine hundred twenty dollars, uh, and uh, expected total expenditures is fifty million uh, four hundred sixty-eight. Fifty million four hundred sixty-eight thousand eight hundred thirty. Now that does not include, of uh, course, a couple of items that we book year in, which would be our tariffs on behalf, as well as any expenditures, campuses or departments made for hearings. Uh, the next several, uh, next several months. Uh, currently, our percentages when we compare current year at this time to last year, uh, we're at 46.37%, and last year we we're at 48.54%. So we're about two percentage points lower than we were last year at the same time, which is a good thing for us. Next slide. Looking at uh, the month of February in comparison to the previous months. Uh, revenues, of course, uh, they're all tax collections at this point, and we will see those numbers start going down significantly as our heavy periods of collections has already passed. Um, but in April, we'll start receiving our state payments again as we're on a specific schedule at the state ends of some so. Uh, the uh, expenditures, you just go a little more. So our expenditures for the month, four million fourteen thousand three hundred sixty-two. Uh, if you look at last month, of course, that in, that included about four hundred thousand dollars for the one-time stipend the board approved for all staff. Uh, so if you took that away from the four point five, you'd be right there about four point one. Uh, so this month's expenditures are pretty in line with that month and uh, similar months uh, before that. So uh, our spending rate is right there where we need to be to sort of try to you know, cut into that def projected deficit. Slides. Take a look at our collections for the month. Uh, our collections for our M and O uh, was 2.2 million. Year to date was 20 million, uh, leaving us a balance of 2.9. So for our uh, levy, we're at about 90 percent of our current year and 87 percent uh, overall. On the INS side, uh, our monthly collections was 1.2 for the current year, uh, 6,000 for delinquent, a total of 1.2. Year to date, collections is 10.8 million, uncollected balance of 1.4 million. And again, we're right there at the same percentages as our MO. Uh, total tax collections uh, month, for the month is three point, almost 3.5 million. And year to date, 31 million. Uh, in comparison to our budget, uh, our MO, we're at about 90, almost 98%. Uh, so we're going to definitely surpass our budgeted MO collections. 
Uh, looking at the numbers today, we were about 350,000 above our budget, which is uh, what we were hoping for. Again, please keep in mind on our MNO, we did budget at 96% collection rate uh, just because of the unknown the COVID and the impact they, that they could have had on the district. Um, INS collections uh, were at 1.2 for the month and year to date, 10. 10 million, 10.8 million percentages there are lower. Uh, when I looked at the budget uh, in, in the INS area, uh, I did uh, have an error in my budgeted number. When I budgeted the INS side, I did budget at 99%, uh, which uh, I do apologize for. So that's why you see a difference in the percentages when you look at INS and the MNO. Um, but again, we're on track there as well to probably meet our uh, expected budget um, and total collections current month 3.5 million year to date uh, 31.1 million and total collections of 93.41 uh, when you look at last year's collections of course uh, it's always a little dynamic because depending on how you budget if you budget conservatively or a little more aggressive that percentage can change based on that um, and so we are definitely ahead on the MNO side uh, in, compar in comparison to last year and last year as well, even though we didn't have COVID, uh, and we did meet our actual budgeted tax collections for that year as well. Uh, so things are looking very positive for us on the tax collection side for us to definitely meet and see uh, our tax collections. Just looking at month to month, uh, again, our tax collection periods, you can see that uh, our biggest month is December, and then it slowly starts declining uh, as we get through the next couple of months and it'll continue to triple down uh, for the next several months where, you know, it'll get into the hundreds of thousands when we look at these reports in the future. Uh, and that's sort of where we wanna be, where we're collecting an extra 100,000 a month to get us to that ultimate collection rate of about 99%. Where, where the district has been historically. Next slide. Uh, this is just a look again at, at the uh, expenditures by, by object code or category. Um, numbers don't change or percentages don't change. So that's more for your reference just to sort of see how we spend in salaries, supplies, et cetera. And again, this is just another view of looking looking at the expenditures by function and by object. So again, it's just informational, so you all, you all can sort of see how it's perfect. Excellent. So looking at salaries uh, over a month-to-month -month period, um, you can see that our salaries for the month of February is almost 3.5 million. Uh, if, again, if you look at last month at 3.9, it included that stipend of about 400,000, so it would have put us right at about 3.5 for the month. So when you look at these month to month, we're right there about 3.5 uh, monthly. And it should stay pretty steady because our salaries aren't annualized, which means we pay evenly throughout the year over the 12 period, with the exception of stipends and overtime. Contracted services for the month of February um, came in at $207,232. Uh, when you look at this in comparison to last month specifically, you can see we came, we came down about 130000 The uh, majority of that came out of Function 41, where last month we paid for our auditing services, which was about $40,000. Uh, in our guidance and counseling uh, area, you can see we have 16000 uh, we have a contract with Trinity University for some graduate LSSPs to come assist the special ed department. And then in uh, what's the other area? In uh, Athletics or in extracurricular in function 36, you can see how it was 69,000 last month. We spent about 40,000 in our softball and uh, baseball fields for uh, the annual meetings we did with those fields to get them ready for the season. 
So between those three things really make up the bulk of that difference in the two months. Here's a look at our supplies and again supplies are going to be very fluid throughout the year just because that's dependent on when the departments or campuses need what they need. Um, but for the month of February, we spent 246000 uh, in, com in comparison to last month, we were at 224. Uh, the biggest item of note in instruction, we uh, only spent 66000 last month. This month, it was up, uh, up to 142000 and the majority of that difference is Chromebooks. We started to receive all our Chromebook orders from last, from last August and uh, July. Finally started to receive them in December and January, so we started making payments in February. Uh, and so you will probably see some of that trickling on for the next month or so or, or uh, supplies. Our travel and miscellaneous, uh, we spent $28,792 for the month. You can see it's down from the previous couple of months. Um, the biggest thing that I noted in Function 11, our instructional function, was last month we spent about 16000 in OSHA certification fees for the CTE program. So we didn't have anything similar to that this month. And in capital expenditures, uh, we did have payment go out for the tennis court refurbishment. And so that's what that 33000 What are the parentheses student transportation during 34? Oh, so the parentheses just mean it's a negative number. And so one of the accounting things that uh, we have to do monthly is whenever there's a new student trips, field trips, there's a student field trip, we have to do a reclassification of expense. So the student or the campus rather pays for that field trip. Uh, but the way that the TEA has set up uh, our accounting practices, we put it in a very specific account whenever we do this, and that account is going to run as a negative expense. So that's just the accumulation of anything like that worth. Or somebody's reimbursing the transportation department for taking the bus or using uh, one of our suburbans or things of that nature. Okay, so it's not student bus runs. No, no, that has nothing to do with that. I can't control the house. Anything other than that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, taking a look at our uh, financial statements for our food service program, um, current period revenue was $350,000. Our year to date was $2.2 million. Our estimate. Uh, Revenues for the remainder of the year is 1.3. Uh, the negative 758 needs will be over our projected budget, which is a good thing. And then on the expenditure side, expenses for the month was $327,000, uh, 286. Uh, our year to date actuals, 1.9 million. And then estimated expenditures for the remainder of the year is 1.5. Uh, with uh, us exceeding our appropriations for our budget on the expense side by 638,000. Um, the positive here is that even though it's both going over budget, uh, we're still projected to have a surplus in the food service program of about 100. So um, things are looking up there. Uh, it's just very hard to project with our food service program because our, our participation is just outstanding. Uh, we, we have the highest participation we've had in years, and that's, uh, you know, uh, thankful to uh, the federal government for making everybody uh, free this year, which is, uh, has helped extremely. But so food service is looking very healthy right now, going forward for this year. Our debt service budget, uh, current period uh, revenues, 1.2 million, year-to-date actuals, 11 million. Uh, and then our budgeted expenditures, current period expenditures, like I mentioned last month, we paid our debt service twice a year. Uh, last month, right in February, we made our first payments for the year, and they, that came in at 7.8 million. And 
So we'll make our second payments in August, and then, of course, we'll have uh, our total revenues by then as well. And then the next pages are just uh, our check registers that we bring monthly. Anybody have any questions or concerns with the financial briefing? And if not, then we'll go ahead and go down the seat. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Uh, uh Superintendent Briefing, the like roll. Thank you, Mr. DeLeon. Uh, just a few things this month. Um, first, the governor did announce a few weeks ago that he would extend Hold Harmless uh, to school districts for the remainder of the school year as long as one of two conditions was met. So remember we talked a lot about Hold Harmless in the fall semester uh, to where even though uh, districts were expected to be down on enrollment, um, the state would still fund you at projected enrollment. So what you should have had if COVID hadn't a hit. So even though we've grown this year as a district, which is on the next slide, we're still not grown to the point that we probably would have been without COVID. So the state's funding us at the point we would have been with COVID for the first semester. The second semester was in limbo. We didn't know what was going to happen. And the governor made an announcement that he would extend hold harmless, which makes sense because the state budgeted that money anyhow uh, to go to districts. So one of two things must be met in order to get that funding for the, for the second semester. So looking at the sixth six weeks, which we haven't gotten to yet, but for the six, six weeks, we have to have at least 80% of our students attending in person, which it looks like we're going to be on track to do, or the number of students in person attendance for the six, six weeks has to be higher than what our in person attendance was on the snapshot date, which is the last Friday in October. And last Friday in October, our in person attendance was 65.1%. We'll easily be above that, um, but we are monitoring that very close too. Uh, Mr. Zamora has run numbers, uh, what that means to the district revenue-wise, and we'll present that next month at the meeting. Uh, but it is substantial and does help close that, that uh, revenue gap that we have this year, the deficit that we have. So it's positive. We, we thank the governor uh, for doing that for, for all the districts in the state. So that was, that was good news. Uh, our enrollment, um, we're up to 6,175 kids. Um, up 267 over the last day of school last year. Uh, that's a four and a half percent increase over the end of last school year. So even with COVID, we, we've still grown quite a bit this year. Not the seven or eight percent that we usually see, but, but still substantially. Uh, if we look at our COVID case count, um, as of last Friday, we had 10 active cases. That's the fewest we have seen in quite a while. Um, we've got 260 recovered cases as of last Friday. We're doing very well as a district considering um, the, the run that COVID had had the last few months, uh, but it's good to see those numbers coming down. In fact, last week, I think we had three days in a row where we had zero new COVID cases. So that was good to see. Today, we had four new COVID cases and one recovery. So we currently have 13 active cases, which is still uh, doing really, really well. That's my entire report this month, sir. <laughs> it's short. We have well, yeah, companies on the hold harmless. And uh, COVID cases are, are going down, which is great news. It's all good stuff. Good stuff. Good news. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Hey, I don't think we have anyone signed up for public comment. So we'll go ahead and go on to discussion of possible action items. The consent agenda items by Dr. Roloff. Yes, sir. We've got minutes for the regular board meeting on February 22nd, uh, workshop on February 24th, and the uh, called meeting on March 4th. I've reviewed those and they look to be in order to me. And we also have some donations tonight to that screen. We have donations to the uh, athletics department from the Athletic Booster Club in the amount of $3,850. Uh, they'd like 3,000 of that to go to the volleyball program and 850 of that to go to football. As always, we thank them. 
uh, for their hard work. That's a lot of concession stands and a lot of fundraisers, as all our booster clubs and PTOs do, and, and we're just always so appreciative of that. And then lastly, I have one purchase over $50,000 that I'm requesting approval on tonight. So uh, you hear Mr. Holshouse talk quite often about uh, FF and E furniture fixtures and equipment for buildings uh, when we have a bond issue. Uh, but when you let out the bid for construction, that doesn't include your library books. We have to do that separately. Uh, so our uh, two district librarians have been working with Mrs. Binky, uh, with Follett, on uh, getting that library stopped at full capacity. So if you remember, we're building that school for 850 kids. And in working with Follett, Follett has recommended that to fully stop that library would be 11,900 titles. Uh, the librarians have worked hard on this, and uh, total cost for those titles ready to be put in our library would be $163,908.13. That is money that is in your FF&E budget. Uh, ready to go just because it's above fifty thousand dollars i can't proceed without board approval you approve this tonight we'll get that order processed and uh, get follow up working on getting us almost twelve thousand books for that new library and we're also on the side of working on the library equity plan that the board discussed and the superintendent evaluation document and we'll have that for you in future board coming as well that's everything I have on your uh, consent agenda. Yes, maybe. Did you have any questions on these on these uh, things? No. Then I'll entertain a motion. I generally can move to approve the consent agenda in the items as presented. Thank you, ma'am. Can I hear a second? Uh, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> I apologize for second the motion. Thank you, ma'am. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? None here any. I will proceed with the vote. When I call your name, please say for or against the motion. Ben Sinsmar. For. Johnny Campbell. For. Shannon Beasley. For. Paul Davidson. For. Pedro. For. Bruce Avey. Four. And I Margaret Elmo Ford. Motion carries. Thank you all very much. Okay, the next item is consider the 2021-2022 construction calendar and 2021-2022 flex calendar. Mr. McKinley. Yes, sir. Uh we've got the calendars here for you this evening. As you recall, you all are a uh, the Dina Valley ISD is a district of innovation. We voted on that. It's great things with construction, certification, uh, and of course, the, the big one uh, for all staff, the insurance that really turned out so well for the district and saving for the employees. And it also allowed us to adopt a calendar that starts a little earlier uh, than we have uh, historically, which is one of the highlights you'll see there that new teachers will be coming in. First week in August, the uh, green cells that you see there in August, so everything's moved up a week. And therefore, at the, at the very end with May, we're looking at the May graduation day. That's, it's been a long time since we've had a, a May graduation day. And so uh, that's on the board. Uh, other significant things, it was uh, it was an interesting year in, with regard to, uh, to spring break. Uh, <laughs> the districts to our east, pretty much had a spring break with us and those to our west had it a week later and there was a split among universities as well. UTSA was with us. Uh, Texas State was uh, with the schools to the west and uh, it just that in mind is the opportunity for our staff to see their college kids coming home. Uh, the good and the other strange part about it was that uh, near the end of our spring break we had daylight savings which is tough on the kids to come back when daylight savings ends at the end of the uh, spring break good news <laughs> moving forward that's that's not the issue this year uh, schools uh to the east that already have their calendars out we don't see a lot of from the west that, that are out yet but it's pretty much unanimous to move it back that week and capture some time for our kiddos in march there beginning the 14th to allow them to adjust to the time change and uh um, 
just about every university that we looked into as well for those kids coming home to, to be with their families. Uh, they're on the same one as well. So that was really a big push for everyone to get back on the, the same page there. Uh, for the first time also that move, you know, uh, typically uh, we would have that uh, the Memorial Day off and graduation happens before then. So the teachers picked up the holiday and they wanted it in October. Sometimes teachers will refer to that as kind of no man's land, uh, that, that distance between the start of the school to uh, right up to Thanksgiving is a long stretch. It's a long stretch for the kiddos too. Uh, so they looked at some April dates, they looked at October and, and they felt that October was more of a need. So that's the other significant. Uh, I would say you're also, uh, with the minutes, it's no longer days. Uh, those minutes really came in handy for us this year. Uh, once again, you've got about six days, uh, six, little over six days uh, of extra minutes in the event that we had a closure I know there's an item on the agenda tonight that uh, the state really helped us with, but uh, with your teacher contracts, the number of days that teachers work, the number of instructional days, uh, not sort of copying out on, on the instructional days and giving our kids the minimum. Uh, this gives us those six bonus days and provides more instruction for the kids in a time when there are so many gaps with COVID and whatnot. Medina Valley has always gone above and beyond with the number of minutes and days in a, in a calendar. We haven't done a lot of waivers. Uh, to take kids out of the, the classroom uh, uh, historically. So it's a strong calendar, uh, lots of minutes. The staff was very pleased to be getting out early, pick up the day in October. It's quite a, a boost for them. And I, I thank them for their hard work and working on the calendar. We also have the flex calendar. Uh, if you want to take a look at that. It is essentially uh, the same calendar with the green cells you see. Uh, in April and in, in May, and those are intervention days uh, that are used to get students back on track for graduation. As you know, we have a good long running number of 100% graduation rate at the high school, and uh, it's definitely a, a time where everyone gets caught up and, and seniors get on track. And uh, this year, we're, even, even with uh, the days that we've seen this year, we still qualify for flex year. We still have those minutes, so our kids will get that extra intervention. And uh, the elementary and middle schools have always done a fantastic job with summer school. This year, high school will be adding summer school due to the COVID gaps, et cetera, and helping those kids in the summer for the first time in many years uh, just to get everyone caught up. But uh, those are the two uh, calendars for Plex uh, for the intervention and our district of innovation calendar for the academic year. Glad to answer any questions that you have. The only complaint I heard was that uh, on this year is that spring break came too early. Yes, sir. Yeah. I said, well, I mean, uh, spring break is spring break. Yeah. Speaks for next year. Yes, sir. It's amazing how it's kind of a split decision between, between east and west, and we were kind of right in the middle yeah. with the breaking line of that, uh, that southwest, north side, UTSA, and then in the middle of the day, Dennis also out to the west. See what you think. I don't think everything else should be worked out just fine. If anybody else has any questions or comments on that, thank you very much, sir. And uh, nobody has anything else. We'll uh, put for a motion on this. I, Terry Grove, move to approve the 2021-2022 district instructional calendar and flex instructional calendar as presented. Thank you, sir. Do we hear a second? I do a camel second. Thank you, ma'am. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Now, hear anything on proceed with the vote. When I call your name, please say four against the motion. President Smart. Jenny Camden. Four. Shannon Easy. Four. Paul Davidson. Four. Dan Grove. Four. Bruce Avey. Four. four. I'm honored on vote four. Motion carried. Thank you all very much. Okay, the next one is to uh, item C is to consider the TA High School A waiver. Dr. Robot. Uh, thank you, Mr. DeLeon. Uh, members of the board, 
As you know, we have a freak winter event this year, uh, Valentine's Day week, and uh, we were closed all week. Uh, Monday was a professional development day. Uh, Friday was on the calendar, too, where we didn't have kids in school. So our students missed uh, Tuesday, February 16th, February 17th, and February 18th. Uh, we we're not sure how we were going to make up those days other than using more minutes, which we you know, used quite a few of our extra minutes to give teachers some, some days to work. And the commissioner announced that we could apply for a missed school day waiver for that week, and they would be granted. So I'm asking you tonight to approve the uh, missed school day waiver for the 16th, 17th, and 18th of February. And I'll submit it tomorrow if you approve it. Um, and we will not have to make up those days and we'll not have to use any of our excess minutes to do that. As with all of the other waivers that I've brought you this year, we have filed more waivers this year than in my whole career uh, because of COVID and now weather. Uh, this did go to our DWAC committee last Tuesday, I believe they met, and they unanimously approved bringing it to the board. I'll call your name, please, here for against the motion. Business Byrne? Four. Daniel Campbell? Four. Shannon Beasley? Four. Paula Davidson? Four. Dave Grove? Four. Bruce Abey? Four. And I'm under on vote four. Motion carried. Okay, item D. Consider resolution regarding weather related closure of school. Dr. Um, yeah, we just talked about the days that our students missed that week. Well, our staff, teachers, all of our staff missed that entire week from the 15th through the 19th. Uh, due to no fault of their own, it was just impossible to have school. Um, as soon as we were done with the weather event, I contacted our attorney and asked him to draw up a resolution for the board to consider uh, to pay employees for that week, since it was not their fault that they weren't at work, and not have to make up those days. That can only be done by board resolution, much like you did last spring when we had to close due to COVID and people couldn't come to work. The resolution also for the few employees that did have to come in that week that we asked to come in to check buildings, water lines, those kind of things in our facilities department, it will pay them for those extra for those hours that they did come in. So they'll get paid for their 40 hours because that's what everyone else in the district is getting. And, and they'll get paid for those extra hours at straight time, not in overtime because they didn't actually work the first 40 hours. Does that make sense? But to keep it fair to everybody, we're asking that you approve that. And we will not have to make up those days then. Never thought I'd do two of these in one one to one year, but, but here we are. Well, pretty simple. If there's no discussion, I'll ask for a motion. I call the to move to approve the resolution regarding weather related closure of school as presented. Thank you, ma'am. I hear a second. I'm to second. Yes. A motion and a second. I'm just going to proceed with the vote. When I call your name, please say for against the motion. Sarah yes. Simpson? Four. Jimmy Campbell? Four. Janet Beasley? Four. Four. Paula Davidson? Four. Terry Grove? Four. Bruce Haven? Four. Four. I'm going to vote for motion carries. Teachers can take it. Okay, item E is uh, consider remote learning contingency plan for the 2021 to 2022 school year. Dr. Hobart and Dr. McKay. Um, members of the board, we're bringing you tonight a plan that may never actually be used. <laughs> but we're trying to be very proactive here. So going into next school year, we do not know yet whether or not the state will allow remote learning at all. It's still an unknown. We know that we're still dealing with COVID. We will most likely be dealing with COVID next school year. Uh, the reason that the commissioner has allowed remote learning is he was granted emergency authority under the governor's executive orders. And therefore, he could fund remote learning, which normally is not allowed under state law to be funded. So as long as the commissioner says that he can fund remote learning, it will probably still be an option to school districts. But the minute that he says he can't fund remote learning, it will cease to be a, an option. So in getting ready for next school year, we need to have a plan in place for remote learning in case it's an option. 
case it's something that we still have that, that kids will need. So Dr. McKayslett and his team have put together what I think is just a great plan for next year. And that before the curriculum committee last week, I think the curriculum committee met, um, it was well received there. Uh, again, I think it's a very strong plan, but it does require us to do some work now to get ready for next year as far as getting parents to uh, tell us if it's an option, will their child be in remote learning, and then do they qualify under the guidelines that we're laying out here as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McKayslett. Up front, I want to thank him and his team. This was a lot of work on something that may never actually be implemented come the fall semester, just depending on what comes out of the state. Sure, just uh, just a little bit to start us off. If you remember, we started the school year, 43% of our, our students were in person. Uh, as we say, I'm not going to work 75%, and it's just a testament to the, uh, and you saw the low numbers of uh, positive testing uh, amongst the students. Uh, so year to date, that's pretty awesome to be at 75% up from 43%. The teachers, the administrators, and the students have done a great job with their masks, et cetera. It's really been a great year uh, as far as that goes. The purpose of this plan is to become more efficient in the case that we would have to have remote uh, next year. And so the way we attacked it this year with such a, a large volume starting remotely, the campuses uh, operated as campuses and dealing with their remote and in-person learner learners. The plan will bring you today, will bring those numbers down significantly, and then we'll address those remote learners as a district, allowing more teachers and by the way, I'd like to thank all the teachers who responded to the survey we sent out. Uh, their their, their uh, input was, was tremendously valuable in developing this plan. And one of the biggest things, of course, as you might imagine, is the strain when, when you operate 43% in person. Uh, so this plan will bring more students in and allow us to dedicate more teachers to own learning versus some having to do both. It's certainly a, a lot of stress. And uh, teaching staff did a, just a wonderful job with that. The major, and I'll just kind of get some high points here in, in page one. I'm going to skip down to, there's a hyperlink there, but we'll talk a little bit about the first and probably the biggest qualifier about, about halfway through this year, TEA stepped up and provided us with a form that said, uh, if you have underlying health conditions, you get a, a health care provider to sign this form, uh, then it's significant. And I'll tell you, we got a lot of a lot of calls from uh, healthcare providers, and so it was a great form. Uh, it wasn't a just check the box and stay home, so that was very helpful. So moving forward, our, our recommendation in this plan is that for any student who wishes to be remote, they need to have this uh, this form filled out and signed by a healthcare provider. That would be our sort of our uh, our first filter in uh, ensuring that the right students are protected and, and, and those other students who need to be with us and not falling behind and the COVID slide and, and gaps among uh, our impoverished students, especially we, we saw this year as we tracked for our impoverished students that we're getting them into classes. The next major point is actually the last bullet on this page. And this is something that, uh, if you recall as a board, uh, you, you uh, put this out there for us to try in the semester. We, we brought back every student who was uh, failing at semester. That was a 100% success rate. Remember, when I say 100% success rate, we don't have the authority to force them back. We had the authority to revoke remote learning, and then they could have gone elsewhere. But they all decided to come back with us, and it was a success story. Our seniors are on a great track for graduation. We're right where we want to be. We're, again, projecting 100%. We've got a ways to go. We're going to make sure they work all the way to the end. Uh, but that was highly successful. So we're saying in the plan that uh, it may be revoked even, even for those on that list if you can't do your part. Uh, and this is uh, two state parameters. And the first is, of course, you have to be on track to graduate and passing. And the second is a state requirement, not a Medina Valley requirement, that you must be 90% in attendance. Anytime after the first six weeks, if, if you're not doing what the state is saying you should be doing, you know, we, would look, we would look at a, you know, a revocation of that. And if you say, well, what if it's an incredibly, incredibly uh, stern type of uh, health or serious self-help issue, we could go into a discussion about homebound services and what that might look like. But other than that, as the teachers ask, there needs to be more of an accountability piece to ensure uh, students are engaged and they're doing their part because we have teachers. Uh, you can tell them not to check their emails late at night, but they're going to do it and they're going to work hard. And so you'll see in this plan, uh, we've made changes for that as well. 
So there'll be a window of opportunity from uh, about mid-May, uh, I'm sorry, mid-April to mid-May, where uh, we will open up what we refer to as our method of instruction. So we will register our method of instruction, whether you would like to be online or in person, in April. And you'll have one month to see your healthcare provider if you want to try to get uh, one of those uh, letters to be exempt from in person. Uh, otherwise, uh, you will be in person. And uh, after that one month period goes by, it's important to note that those students who who, who uh, submitted a form uh, after the first semester of failures, so they'll have to get a fresh one in that month time. And I think that was a good addition to this that, that they do need to have another checkup and see how we're doing, especially with the, the vaccinations, because of the way it's written up it actually says, even if you have a person at home that is comp immunocompromised, that, that may be a factor in the healthcare provider uh, signing off. But of course, with all vaccinations, again, we expect some positive results there. Now, if they want to change after that May day, all right, I've, I've changed and, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be remote. And then you decide you want to come in person. That deadline is over to, to say that you're remote, but we want you in school. So uh, by, if you can uh, make that final decision by July 1st, and that's when we start, technically start our academic school year, really. That's when our, our you know, our elementary principals will be coming back on contract. And at that point, we need to get going. And so we'll be planning for our classrooms so we don't strain those teachers in the last minute. If you can't do it by July 1st, you're going to have to wait till the end of the first grading period so that uh, we're respectful of our teachers and we can provide the best instruction in person. In Under logistics, uh, there at the bottom of the second page, uh, we approved, uh, I'm sorry, you all approved uh, the design of a uh, asynchronous learning environment, which basically meant it was comparison of asynchronous and synchronous. Synchronous means it's just like you're in the classroom. If uh, if you have world history at three o'clock, then you're online with world history at three, three o'clock. One of the main, one of the unknowns there was, you know, are we gonna be able to collect it? That's the only time you could take attendance, period. So if they missed that for whatever reason, they were absent, they're in danger of the 90% rule. Uh, they, uh, state funding wouldn't be there either. Uh, so synchronous, uh, is, is has to be in real time. We adopted asynchronous, and the neat thing about asynchronous is it allows you to do both. Uh, it, that, that's the best part about it is if you want to have synchronous requirements, which we're presenting to you today that we need to have to hold students, as the teacher said, we need some more accountability here. Uh, we will have a defined school day, and uh, we would have required daily meetings, all synchronous style. You need to be there when you're supposed to be there with that certified teacher who can help you, and that teacher not checking emails at midnight and being overworked and trying to, to juggle all this. Asynchronous in the, in, the, in the term of flexibility, if the teacher decided, you know, a student had a dentist appointment that day and they submitted work to that teacher, and that teacher under this plan could count press. But by no means is a teacher committed to services outside school day. This is delineating the child will be in school. So if it wasn't a, 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 an issue with the dentist appointment or whatnot, or we're giving the teacher the power to teach the discretion, uh, we'd be looking at revoking if they can't make it to their classes when the teachers are in their work day. Uh, on page three, just a couple of things on attendance there, remote attendance. Um, as I just stated, the, the teacher would be taking the attendance right now. Attendance is measured through Google Classroom, and it is a uh, it's a 24-hour wraparound by state definition. So you can be you can be counted present within a 24-hour period. It's all that flexibility. The problem is teachers are having to go back and check 24 hours later. Uh, the attendance is in. We can we can take attendance through Google Classroom, but they have to go back and verify. So now with this new plan, we're calling it asynchronous with that flexibility, but requiring the synchronous timeline, you have to be in there. The teacher's going to check in, and we're not going to have teachers checking attendance, uh, you know, over a two-day period, it seems like, sometimes even more. Um, in, in our committee, curriculum committee, a good point, and we appreciate your guidance in the uh, curriculum committee. Special populations and supports are critical. Uh, there are many bullets listed there, and there will be dedicated staff. All this will be formula-based. So uh, we project by the end of the week, we will have all of our students ready to be assigned their, their campus entities. So then in April, we'll find out who's going to be remote, and then we'll also find out 
how many special needs kids we have and what support we need to provide them. It'll be formula based. They will get the support they need based on the formula. Uh, if, if, if we don't have, for example, if, if we don't have any uh, EL students, let's say, that are remote, they're all in person, they will be able to get that quality uh, instruction in class. Bilingual teachers are at a premium, as we know. Uh, so our hopes is to keep those numbers manageable and, and, and support those students by formula, not campuses working in isolation to try to solve the problem on their own. Uh, and, and another big one here, almost at the bottom of the page, all extracurriculars will require in-person uh, participation uh, in order to participate in extracurricular activities. Uh, this is something that Fredericksburg this, did this year and was very successful visiting with uh, everyone from uh, athletics to our, our ag department. They were they were all on board with this and said, that's, that's the way it, it needs to be. Uh, they need to be here with us. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're, uh, whether it's basketball, volleyball, and uh, any other type, where if you can be in a, in a hotel room or you can be in a, in a huddle, then you can be in class. And so all of our, uh, all of our sponsors were very much in support of that. So that is another recommendation. And I think the, the final one on the page that is most significant is you will not participate in re remote learning if your family does not participate in a required orientation that outlines, again, accountability, expectations of what it is you're going to do. If you can't be uh, parental engagement, sometimes is a tell them again, well, if, if you really want this remote learning, we need to work together and, and we need the parents plugged in as well. Uh, so that will be a requirement in order to qualify. You must participate in the orientation. And if you want to do that remotely, that's fine. But we must get together to do our best job for the kids. The final page is just on resources. And I won't go into that, but I assure you that is a, a wealth of information and the hyperlinks. That is a, that's a lot of information that's there for your review. Uh, but that information would be included in the uh, parent orientation. Uh, so that's uh, a quick overview of the uh, contingency plan. And, uh, I think is a, is a good one and uh, hope we don't have to use it, but if we do, I think it's a good plan. I think what's really important in this plan is we're trying to make it to where teachers aren't having to do both labs. So they're, you know, the elementary level, they're teaching remote. So you might have one, correct me if I'm wrong, one fourth grade teacher teaching math to remote fourth grade students in the whole district, rather than a teacher at every campus having to do that. Uh, High school, we'd have dedicated class periods because you know you have one calculus teacher. So, but there would be a period in the day that that teacher is just teaching remote kids, rather than trying to juggle both during a, during a class period. So, trying to ease that burden on teachers and so they don't have so much on their plate. I, I think that's the biggest takeaway from this plan. So now that's on the, you know this plan, if it is that. Uh, if we do have to use it so there will be not be no recordings of the teachers yeah, we could we have the full menu by declaring asynchronous we have the full menu of any form of education we want if we were to choose the synchronous which is what we're going to do with attendance and have those kids in the classroom that flexibility would be gone so asynchronous gives us both yes sir you we, we will still be able to do that so the main sticking point this year was the uh attendance part, right? That's what we had the problem with on the remote learners? It, it was significant. The, the flexibility you have allows you to have pretty good attendance. Our, overall, our attendance was pretty good, all things considered. But, you know, it's just not good enough to have a student turning in work at midnight and consider that the best one. Although that's the state guidelines. Uh, that's just not the best one. We'd like to hold more accountability, as the teacher said, and have those kids with a teacher. Anybody else got any comments or questions on this thing? Hopefully, it might never come about, but I think um, they have something in hand, then we sure. start at the end. So, if there's no more discussion, then uh, if someone would like to make a motion on this, thank you, Dr. McGainsey. Defense is to approve remote learning contingency plan for the 2021-2022 school year at Thank you, ma'am. Do I hear a second? 
Secretary Terry Grove second the motion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Hammond. Motion and second. If there's no further discussion, I will proceed with the vote. And I find NPC four against the motion. President Smart. Four. Jenny Campbell. Four. Shannon Beasley. Four. Four. Paul Davison. Four. Terry Grove. Four. Bruce Amy. Four. And I'm under double vote for it. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Okay, one, two, ten is to consider ten B initiated local policy update one sixteen affecting local policy CQB, BCD, GKA, and DEC with provisions and FFAC with provisions. Dr. Robach. Uh, thank you, Mr. Berrion. Members of the board, uh, last month we had the first reading on policy update 2016, and I told you at that time that we would work on policy DEC, which deals with uh, non-Chapter 21 contracts, and with FFAC, which deals with health services to reflect current district practice. Uh, we worked with, Lori worked with our TASNIC policy consultant on those two policies. So what I have up on your screen right now is DCE local. you remember it listed just three positions as uh, receiving non-chapter 21 contracts, director of technology, director of maintenance, and director of food service. I think those have been carried in this policy probably since the policy was written. And at the time it was written, those were the only three positions in the district that, that had non-chapter 21 contracts. We talked about that at the last board meeting. We looked at other districts around us and to see what their language was like. And what's in the blue is what most of them had and what TASB recommended. And so what we will do now each year is we will bring you a list of positions that receive non-chapter 21 contracts for approval going forward. So um, thank you to TASB Policy for helping us on that. And then on medical treatment, Lori worked with our policy consultant with our nurse, nurse Tina Schmelzer, to make sure that our policy reflected uh, practice of the district and substantial changes were needed. And I, I hope you had a chance to look through this, um, but this was written up by TASB policy. It does now accurately reflect uh, what we do in this district, particularly on medication uh, issuance and uh, what items we keep on hand, such as EpiPens. Most of you have EpiPens available to them if needed. That was not reflected in the policy. Some over-the-counter medications, such as Tylenol, in certain instances might be given to students. Uh, that wasn't reflected in policy. So I'm working with, with Tina and with the TASB policy. We now have a, a proposed policy that very accurately reflects district practice. My recommendation is, is for approval. Thank everyone that worked hard on these policies. A lot of work. Do you have any questions? The presentation there? But nothing. Uh, I'm all uh, for a motion. I'll do it. There's a pride bill on here, so uh, I, Terry Growth, move to approve the TASB initiated local policy update 116 affecting local policies. CQB, DCD, GKA, and then DCE with revisions and FFAC with revisions as presented. Thank you, sir. Do I hear a second? I think my second motion. Thank you, ma'am. We have a motion and a second. If there's no any any further discussion, I will proceed with the vote. President Smart. Four. Lee Campbell. Four. Shannon Beasley. Four. Paula Davison. Pedro. Four. Bruce Amy. Four. Four. I'm under number four. Motion carried. Next item, which is key, will be considered resolution nominating Dr. Kenneth Robot 
for Jasby Superintendent of the Year Award. I guess it falls in my pocket. Uh, I think we, we've talked about this a couple of times, and Dr. Obart's been a little bit shorter on that, but uh, through all the pandemic and crisis and weather and who knows everything else, remote learning that we've been having, um, I feel that he's done an excellent job in guiding us. Uh, who doesn't have hiccups, but we all have hiccups, but we still uh, work through it and we got the resolutions that we needed. And I think the faculty and the administration is happy with all everything we've done. So I do recommend this that we, if uh, we can get something on there and we can write this up and maybe get him the distinguishing uh, award that he needs. If anybody else has any comment on this, again, now would be a time to share it. So who writes this up? Set? Who's, who's going to write this up? All of us. We all have something to put into this. We all put into the thing. Um, record everybody in administration, everybody. So they got the community also. Is involved in internet, so then we just go from there. So we have like have a big meeting and everybody writes it up. Well, I'm not sure how that goes. This is the first time I do it. And then you guys are kept informed the whole way so that you can edit, add comments, revisions, ideas. Yeah, it turns out. Right. All you do is present. I haven't either. I've just been commenting on the last time, but uh, only done it a couple of times here. But uh, everybody's input or <coughs> feelings toward him and his accomplishments. We put all that down and let somebody else be the judge. So I think this is something we should do. So I look for a motion from you on this to proceed. I just think my to through the resolution nominating Dr. King Burbach for the TASB Superintendent of the Year Award as president. Thank you, ma'am. Do I hear a second? Uh, Shannon Beasley seconds that motion. Thank you very much. Having a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, I'll just proceed with the vote. And I thought you need to say four against the motion. Ten cents, Mike. Four. Kennedy Campbell? Four. Shannon Beasley? Four. Paula Davison? Terry Grove? Four. Bruce Amy? Against. And I'm running on vote four. Motion carries. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Okay, we come to the fun part of the meeting. The Board of Trustees will convene in the closed meeting now at uh, 7.46 p.m. All voting for action will take place when the Board and Superintendent reconvene at an open meeting video conference. Feel free to remain in the video conference during this time. Board Member Dr. Robert, please enter this meeting and enter the closed session.
Okay, we're back. We're reconvened into open session. And 8.28 p.m. When I call your name, please take for the record your attendance. Ben Zinsmar? Here. Jenny Campbell? Here. Chad Beasley? Here. Paula Davidson? Here. Terry Grove here. Bruce Avey here. Martin Gilton here. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item is to consider continued discussion of possible action items. So consider professional contract recommendations. Dr. Robot. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Daly, all members of the board, I'm, I'm very pleased to recommend to you tonight uh, Selena Vieta uh, for our communications coordinator position, very qualified young lady, excited to uh, recommend her to you, and I'm also recommending that uh, contracts be extended for members of my cabinet, Dr. McKayslet, Mr. Zamora, Mrs. Binky, Mr. Magura, and the seven campus principals at this time uh, for another year, bringing the remainder of contracts next month. Any further discussion on that matter? If not, I will ask for a motion. I'm going to move to approve the contract recommendations by the superintendent for professional contracts as presented. Thank you, ma'am. Are you a second? I, Terry Grove, second the motion. Thank you, sir. I have a motion and a second. Without any further discussion, I will proceed with the vote. I'm not quite able to say for or against the motion. President Martin. Tiffany Campbell. Four. Chan Beasley. Four. Paula Davidson. Four. Dave Grove. Four. Bruce Avey. Four. Now we're going to vote for motion carried. Congratulations to the following of the Invalid ISD new hires. Ms. Selena Vieta, Communication Coordinator. Welcome on board. The okay, next item is to consider consideration of future meeting dates. Uh, your next regular meeting is Monday, April 19th. Don't think we'll need a meeting in between then, but if we do, I will contact all of you. Okay. All right. Then, would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn? I, Terry Gross, move to adjourn the regular board meeting at 8.31 on March 22nd, 2021. Do I hear a second? I call the Davidson second the motion. Thank you. Great. My party name, please, here for against the motion. Good sense, Martin. Jenny Campbell. Four. Can I be the four? Paul Davidson? Four. Very good. Four. Bruce Avey? Four. Now Martin will vote four. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you all.